if you could travel with one other doctor's companion, who would it be? No, no. No? <laughs> no, fundamentalist Rose. I don't like all that. Rose is my Rose. Let's hear it for the amazing actor, ninth doctor, Christopher Eccleson. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely welcome. I'm very jet lagged and that's changed things. So you just came over across the pond like yesterday. Um, I arrived last night about at the hotel about 12. Oh my god. The flight was delayed about four hours, so. Well, I'm not complaining, but, but this has really pet me up. Hey, he flew all the way here for you guys. All the way here, man. Now, I know you've, I know you've traveled the world um, for, whether professionally or for leisure, but do you have a, a, a place that you like to, to visit most often? Like, what's your, you know, whether it's vacation or for work, like, what's your place you like to visit? Well, I'm happiest most of all when I'm with my two children, Albert and Esme. Okay. Albert's... Um, 11, Esme's 9. We go to Cornwall a lot, which is the southwest of England. But they've got a little bit sick of that, so we're not, we, I took them there too much. But in America, I, um, I really love New Orleans, I have to say. And I love Austin too. Uh, and of course, Washington. Now, my, my, my kids have made it just past the nine and 10 year old phase. And, you know, they went from thinking I was like the coolest human on the planet to like, they don't want to even be in the same room with me now. So my kids never thought I was cool. <laughs> I was going to ask you like, uh, what did they, what did, you're, you're so cool. Like, what do they think about dad? No, my son said to me once when he was about five or six, he said, a guy came up to me, dad, and said that you're the best doctor. Wait for it. He said, does that mean you're good at making people feel better? <laughs> I, showed them, I showed them Doctor Who and they were, they were terrified. <laughs> because it wasn't just the fact that the show can be frightening, it was that their dad <laughs> was in jeopardy, which was very sweet as well. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of, you know, just kids, uh, of course we have so many Whovians in the room, but before we even get into that, if we go back to when you were like nine or ten, um, you know, we have so many fans here of so many things. What were you a, a fan of, like when you were nine and ten years old? Do you remember? First actor I really, I thought was real and true was Jimmy Cagney in White Heat and uh, Top of the World, Ma, in that film, and also in Angels with Dirty Faces. Cagney, I thought, was incredible, because he was so real, but he could also do the song and dance thing. And then there was an actor called Patrick McGowan. Yeah, British actor, who did a show called Danger Man, which I loved, and then he, he then went on to do The Prisoner. Um, and I was, a, me and my dad were massive Trekkies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rest of the time, I was running about in the streets. I, I, I like TV, but I like running around in the streets playing football, not soccer. Really? You hit, kick it with your foot. <laughs> you don't sock it with your foot. <laughs> well, uh, I, I got to think um, no one grows up thinking that they're going to be the, the ninth doctor or be a doctor. And so when you were growing up, did you have aspirations to act and be in entertainment? No, I, w I wanted to play football for Manchester United. <laughs> and uh, I still do. <laughs> it's a true story. I dream that I'm playing for Manchester United nearly every night. And Alex Ferguson, who was the greatest manager who ever lived, every time I glance at him and he's just going like this. <laughs> um, 
it, it came to me probably around, I, I was put in a play when I was 17 and um, they allowed me to put eyeliner on. You know, black eyeliner? And one of the girls afterwards said, oh, your eyes ni look nice. So I thought I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> well, from that point on, was there a, what was the thing that kind of helped you take your first step into acting? Um, well, I, I trained for two years at the Salford College of Technology, which is where I grew up. And this is 1981, and there was a massive amount of unemployment and depression. Thank you, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Um, in, 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 uh, in my country, for both countries, really, for blue-collar people, let's be honest. Um, and I just wanted to get out of Manchester. I just wanted to get away from the kind of jobs, with respect, that my mom and dad and my brothers had to do. And somebody told me that all the drama schools were in London. So I heard London and that was me. And I got into a drama school, did three years, didn't work for three years after I got out, thought I was gonna give up acting. And then I got a lead in a feature film and then suddenly I was an actor. Amazing, it's amazing. Now, you haven't, um, really haven't been doing a lot of conventions till more recently, like I guess yeah. like the past few years, pre-pandemic and then yeah. now. What, what has it meant to you to sort of like re-enter this world and just sort of really re-enter like Doctor Who fandom and all that? What has it meant to you? I resisted the conventions because I thought I would be ripping you all off financially. Well, that was my conviction. I'm still not utterly convinced that we're not doing that. <laughs> And I say that with seriousness, but it's been an um, incredibly positive thing in my life because I've realized that people, when they meet a doctor, always have a personal connection with the show and their particular favorite doctor. And I've, I've, I've been told some incredibly emotional, even today, um, I hope the gentleman's here, Right at the beginning of the day, I hope this gentleman here is here and he doesn't mind me sharing it. He, he, he'd done service in Iraq and he'd suffered from PTSD. And of course, my doctor had that. And he said that it helped him. So as a human being, to get that kind of information, and that was the first person I spoke to this morning and we both cried. Two big tough guys crying in a convention. It's 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 you know it's wonderful, and I'm I'm very grateful for it, and my son and daughter are very grateful for it. So thank you. Well, I'm going to kick us off with a couple of uh, Doctor Who related questions, but we do have a couple of microphones here under these lights, and so if you have a question, line up, and I'll get with you guys shortly. All right, so, uh, you know, Doctor Who had been um, this huge phenomenon in, in England and around the world, and, uh, but it had been dormant for some time, and so when the, the idea of the Doctor coming back and you coming into it, how did you intersect with that, and was it something that you were reluctant, were you excited, what, what were your sort of thoughts about, and how did that role come for you? I did a show with Russell T. Davis uh, in 2002, called A Second Coming. And at that time, Russell was one of my favorite writers, um, very political writer, um, queer as folk, the show that he wrote in the early 2000s changed a lot of things um, for gay people in my country and in my town, because it's set in the gay village in Manchester. Um, and I loved working with him, I loved his writing, and I heard that the next thing he was going to do was Doctor Who, and because I thought he was a great writer, I emailed him and said, audition me. So, I made it happen. I wasn't a fan of the show, please don't kill me. Um, you, you get a pass. You get I was a, a fan of the writing. 
So I, I, um, I asked to be auditioned and I got the role. Um, from, yeah. It, it's, especially in this, uh, in the, the new era from 2005 on, like it was such a, um, I mean, such a incredible and there's no, just no, no show like it. So when you, um, first did that role for that whole year and when it first started out to when it concluded, did your, um, expectations change? Like as far as what you expected going into it versus what you got out of it? When yeah, I wasn't, I, I was not aware of the phenomenon that it is. I wasn't. Um, it was a job to me and because if you start to think of, if you're playing Hamlet or Macbeth, if you start to think of all the baggage that comes with it, you can't do the job. So I blocked it all out. Uh, and it's only su subsequently at the conventions and maybe in the first couple of months when I was mobbed at an airport in Manchester, <laughs> when the show was running, that I realized the, the passion. And, uh, and then when you come to America and, 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 and to European countries and see fandom, that's when, when the penny drops. Well, a question that inevitably every fan always asks, which we need to get this out of the way, is uh, we know it was a, a while ago and you've moved on to many other projects, but is there a particular episode that sort of stands out as one that you enjoyed shooting or experiencing or something that kind of, uh, as you look back at your time as a doctor, as your favorite episode? As a television maker, I was, I mean, I was 20 years, 25 years into a career when I I'd made a lot of television, a lot of films, and I really felt with The Empty Child, which was written, right, um, that's my agent over there, um, which was written brilliantly by Stephen Moffat. I really felt, I think that's the best thing we did in that series. I just, I knew, that people were going to be terrified, particularly children, and I understood that my job was to a certain extent make sure there was still fun in the fear, in the way the doctor reacted to the gas masks, gas mask children. I think that was, yeah. Yeah, I also tried to introduce my kids to Doctor Who, and they didn't make, make it past the mannequins in the first episode. It was uh, just, yeah. <laughs> it was just <laughs> too much. Too much. Um, uh, tell us about uh, working with, uh, I mean, two brilliant writers, Russell T. Davies, Stephen Moffat. I mean, what was, what was it like? There, was just, other, there yeah. were other writers of as course. well uh, on the show. But, I mean, Russell, it, 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 it was Russell's vision. He's the person who is responsible for this resurgence. Um, um, he feminized it, I think, by using, you know, there was a time where, the assistant, the female assistant, ran around in bikinis and, and, and Russell changed that. He empowered the female character in it, uh, Billy Piper's Rose. And, I, you know, I think that was the first step. And then perhaps me doing it in a blue collar accent was another step towards what we have today, where really he's all about humanity and it, it, the show is all about humanity and inclusion and e equality. There are, there are subtle ways to be political, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be part of that. That's awesome. What's up? Why don't we go to our uh, fans here? Um, let's go to the left over here. Tell us your name, how many awesome cons, and then your one question. One, please, one. Go ahead. Um, my name is Mary. This is my second year at Awesome Con. And something we know about the doctors is that they usually have input in what their outfit looks like. So I'd like to know what your inspiration was with picking your outfit for the show. Um, in episode one, Russell T. Davis had written, you know, there was, a, there was quite a lot of debate at the time. Some of the costumes for the doctors had got a little too florid. <laughs> Um, and there'd actually been a change in the way superheroes were presented, more physical. 
Um, and I suppose I was a physical actor. So I thought about that. So the boots were very practical, you know, grounded. Um, and he mentioned that the guy wore a leather, he wears a leather jacket. Russell was trying to modernize him. Actually, Russell used to wear a brown leather jacket. Um, so I put it together, really. You know, I'm sure by the second series, everybody was in the... You know, when you do the first series of a show like this, nobody... Everybody thought it was a folly. Everybody thought it was Russell T. Davis's and Chris Eccleston's folly. Nobody thought it would work. So all those things, you were just left to do it. But I would imagine when David Tennant turned up, everybody was in the room giving an opinion which is why I wouldn't have lasted five minutes, you know, because <laughs> I don't listen. Um, um, so I had a lot of input into the... But, I, you know, I think what happened with the, with the show is the costume... There were some brilliant actors, but the costume became the performance. And I just wanted it to be practical, and I wanted it to be the, about the two hearts and the mind. Thank you. Nice leather jacket, by yeah, the way. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think she's representing, so. Hi, go ahead. Hi, my name is Austin, and I've been coming to, uh, to Awesome Con for a very long time now. I think this is my sixth or seventh year. And I have to say, there were episodes like, like Dalek that... Well, I believe, as you used to put it, fantastic. And I have to ask, how did you get into the headspace for that episode? Like the whole shell-shocked veteran dealing with the last, or at least at that moment, the last of the Daleks. Like, how did you get into the right mind space for that? It's all about the writing. If you say the lines, you're in the mind space. I mean, a, a lot of actors talk about process. You know, and I went to a very dark place. And I think, well, I spoke to a veteran from Iraq this morning. Actors don't go to dark places. It's bullshit. Um, it's, it's about the writing. Uh, and then it's about your imagination and your instinct. Uh, and it's also about having fun. You know, it's pretend. You're just pretending. Um, my kids do it all the time they're amazing actors they just don't get paid <laughs> <laughs> thank you you're welcome all right all right thank you hi my name is caitlin um well, oh sorry oh i'm sorry was that my, my next <laughs> i'm getting old <laughs> okay hi my name is caitlin um it's my second year at um, awesome con uh, first off, I just have to say thank you. You are my first doctor. You are the one that made me love Doctor Who. And I don't think Doctor Who would be here today if it weren't for your performance. So you're here, you're here. Thank you so much. It's a very nice thing to say, but it's always about the writers first. You know it is. But I, I was the tip of an iceberg, and I was grateful to be it, but thank you. So, my question is, if you could travel with one other doctor's companion, who would it be? No, no. No? <laughs> no, fundamentalist Rose. I don't like all that. Rose is my Rose. Yes, Rose is your Rose. <laughs> all this, all this multi-doctor, I don't like it. Well, thank you. It becomes you. about the doctor and the Rose rather than the doctor and the assistant or the the six doctors. I'm not interested. I'm interested in humanity and the adventure and the aliens. Yes. But his heart belongs to Rose. End of. Nobody Thank comes close. Aw. Thank you so much. Was there a particular uh, villain or alien that you found most, most interesting or had the most potential to explore? I think the children with the gas masks was just, that was, I think, and I know we're all adults in here, but it is a children's show as well. And to take the audience and make them 
the antagonist. If I'd have been a 10-year-old kid, I'd have thought, I'm going to get a gas mask on and terrify my mum and dad. <laughs> that was a master stroke. But the Dalek, because the Dalek clearly, the Dalek clearly is um, fascism. It's clearly a representation of Nazi, Nazi Germany. I, it, it's got to be. Uh, and so that is fascinating. And the fact that, of course, they, the Daleks are the doctor's kryptonite. Oh, I'm going cross genre now, aren't I? Those two, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I really liked the ones that look like baked potatoes. <laughs> Tell me their name. Yeah. <laughs> baked potatoes. All right, go ahead, over here. Hi, Christopher, I'm Julia. Um, Hi, I just Julia. want to follow up saying that The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances are my favorite episodes, so it's such a great storyline, and mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree. The writing in your series was fantastic, so thank you. Thank you. And so I am very happy that your story has continued in the Big Finish audio stories. What... <laughs> What has been your favorite story that you've been able to explore in the audioverse? I'm going to have to tease you a bit here. I did something for the 60th anniversary <laughs> with one of the greatest British actors who ever walked the planet and one of the most beautiful human beings who has since passed. And that's in the can. And if he'd have played the doctor, Tom Baker, John Pertwee, not, you would not have heard of any of them. If this act, he's the definitive actor who should have played the doctor. So I did something with him where we are both somebody. And that's upcoming. You've piqued my interest. Thank you very much for You're being welcome. here. It's a lovely dress you have on, Sue. You, if you've noticed, uh, you know, I've been going to Comic-Cons for 20 years now, and every fandom has an amazing representation of cosplay, but Doctor Who cosplay is at a whole nother oh, level. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible. The creativity, the diversity, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it's amazing. The mashups, all that's amazing. I think that's because, you know, the series changes and the Doctors changes, so you can mash up and, you, yeah, fluid. Absolutely, so... Please go ahead. Hi, Christopher. I'm Liz. She, her. Lovely to meet you. Hi. Um, this is my first awesome con, and <laughs> most people know that you kind of had a complicated relationship with Doctor Who for a number of years after you left the show. I have what... a complicated relationship <laughs> with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so Don't we all? Fair enough. Um, fair enough. <laughs> what was your first step to, like, kind of having an improved relationship to where you could start coming to cons and things like that. Like, how did you get to that point? Bankruptcy. <laughs> Divorce. <laughs> Custody battles. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, people lie, don't they? I, money. <laughs> That's fair. I'm sorry. No. I'd love to say, because I love you all. <laughs> it's a job as well. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I, I, I loved playing the doctor I did not love some of the people I had to work with mm -hmm. just like you don't like to love like everybody who works in your office yeah. or on your building site you know um, I loved playing the doctor mm -hmm. and doing the conventions the first convention I did I was stunned mm -hmm. by the the personal stories. I mean, I'm an actor. My, my job is to study people. And I get so much information from you all. <laughs> I get so much material. <laughs> really. And, um, and, and the standard of the writing on uh, Big Finish. I can't believe that some of the dramas I've recorded for audio have not been used visually in the television series. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about Big Finish, that their, their, their writers are top draw. 
I hadn't even heard about Big Finish until today, so I'm going to listen Yeah, the soon. Big Finish audios, <laughs> really, they're, they're, they're some really great writers. Thank you so much. We're so Thank happy you. to give you our money. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to take it. <laughs> Let's give it up for money. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm talking about money, yeah. money. <laughs> Did the earth move for you, Nancy? All right, over here. Hi, I'm Francis. This is my third awesome con. Um, some, well, my original question was taken, so I've got two others instead now. You got a uh, British accent? Yeah, a long time ago, but uh, I moved here when I was 10, which is back in 2006. It's still in there. Whereabouts? Somehow, somehow. Where, um, whereabouts are you from? Uh, Oxford, very long time ago. Okay. But, uh, uh, first question I had was, uh, did you get to keep the jacket? And the second is, was it Bernard Cribbins you were just talking about? For the tease. No, I didn't get to keep anything. Apart from my two hearts. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it wasn't Bernard Cribbins, no. Oh. But that was a very good punt. And he was... Amazing, Bernard Cribbins. He's somebody else who we've lost. And of course, we lost Glenda Jackson. And what, wow. What an influence she was on me. Wow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, let, let's take a uh, uh, Doctor Who detour and uh, talk about... Uh, you know, you've been a part of helping to build the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe with your role as Malekith on Thor The Dark World. Uh, you recognize me? Uh, I mean, it was a tremendous amount of makeup, and I mean, it was just, I mean, tell us about ex that experience, and um, what was that like? I've never met so many producers called Bob in my life. <laughs> hey, Chris, this is Bob. This is Bob, this is Bob, this is John, this is Bob, Bob, and Bob. And none of them told me that I was going to be in makeup for eight hours. They said there's going to be a little bit of makeup. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth was an absolute gentleman. Um, Alan Taylor, who directed it, everybody was great on it. But I didn't, I mean, I got, you know, I'm, I was with the makeup artist all the time. <laughs> Um, but it was nice to see the reaction uh, to it. Uh, but I don't know why they hired me, really, because it doesn't look like me, <laughs> apart from the ears, of course. Uh, no, it was, it was an interesting experience, not the most creative of, of, of uh, my roles, I have to say. <laughs> well, you were brilliant at it. Thank so, you. Yeah. All right, over here. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Wendy. This is my first awesome con. What's the name of the person on your head, Wendy? It's Piplup. Of course. <laughs> it's Piplup. <laughs> I was wondering, are you my mummy? <laughs> Actually, I was wondering if any of the episodes have ever given you nightmares. Because they have me, and so I was wondering if I'm the only one. Some of the people I, I had to work with have given me nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if anyone would have done, it would have been the Dalek episode, because I shot that when my father, Ronnie, had dementia and he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and he was in intensive care. And I was with him for about a week, from about 12 at night until 4 in the morning, watching, an, watching my beautiful father, who had dementia, fighting, you know. And I remember going in to shoot that after two weeks away with a certain amount of anger, <laughs> a, certain amount, a certain level of emotional turmoil and anger. So maybe that got all mixed up. Um, I was never scared of the Slovenes. Never. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, over here. Um, hi, my name's Damien. This is my seventh uh, awesome con. 
Um, Chris is someone who, I did the opposite from you, I went from London to Manchester for a while and actually spent a lot of time on Canal Street in the village during the, um, the era of career as folk, so. Um, I wanted you to naughty, thank- naughty boy. <laughs> as a student, man. Um, I want to thank you for bringing kind of uh, that blue collar influence to the doctor and for bringing it back to us. My question is completely unrelated. Who do you think is going to win the Ashes and what do you think the score will be? <laughs> oh, man. We're getting into it now. I, I was obsessed with sport at school. And the only game I didn't like was cricket. <laughs> because cricket interrupted me playing football. But from what I know, didn't um, somebody score a century yesterday? Yeah, Root got a century yesterday. And then they declared. just got a century today. And then they declared. Who got a century today? Uzwaja, so the opener for Australia. I can't believe I'm in America talking about cricket. (laughs) What? England are going to win the Ashes. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Kids, uh, Google cricket later on. Okay, so. Um, another detour before more questions. It's uh, baseball with pretensions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another quick detour. Um, you've played Destro, one of my favorite yeah. childhood villains, Destro. Yeah. I had a three and three quarter inch figure of you. And so tell us about uh, playing Destro. What was that like for two films? Uh, Again, it was an interesting makeup experience because I got my face burnt off. And then I was waiting to play Destro with the metal face. Um, And we thought we were creating a franchise there, but we didn't. I think there was problems at a a script level myself. I think it was a, a massively, particularly the portrayal of Destro, he's fascinating. Um, And we had, you know, great actor playing G.I. Joe. Uh, It was a missed opportunity, as Hollywood so often does, sadly. It was just thinking about the money and the franchise before it it was thinking about the actual film. Um, But, again, our lead actor was a gentleman, and I met a lot of great people on it. Mm. Well, I don't want to give you spoilers, but uh, if you've seen a particular movie, there was a particular little teaser that's... G.I. Joe might not be over, but anyway. Well, well they we, never we, called me. <laughs> <laughs> Who's playing Metal Face? <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So, all right. <laughs> Who's playing Destro? <laughs> My <laughs> agent's over there. They should know. Oh, he's drunk. Uh, all right, go ahead. Hi. Uh, oh, shit, that's too close. Um, I'm Sarah Elspeth. A uh, quick shout out. Speaking of great writers, I got to meet Robert Shearman a few years ago, and just applause to that man. He had nothing but kind things to say to you, to say about you. Oh, thank you. Um, also, um, my question is also big finish related. What's it been like coming back to the Ninth Doctor? now knowing your impact on the fandom. Because when you first did it, you weren't familiar really with Doctor Who. No. So what's it like? It was very easy. Um, <laughs> I, because the scripts were, you know, the, the writers had obviously absorbed what the writers had created in, in that first series and what I'd brought to it. And so it was all there for me. Um, and it's been tremendous fun. We go to this, what we call in the UK, an industrial estate, 10 miles up the devil's arsehole, as you know, horrible place. <laughs> and we create this magic in this tiny, tiny space, you know. Uh, and and we, 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 we recorded some during COVID. So I would be the only person in the studio and everybody else would have to phone in which was not fun, because the fun is, when you do a big finish audio, is for everybody to be together. Um, But it was just like putting on a pair of very comfortable old boots. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, My name is Michael. I was wondering, you did a movie called Jude back in the 1990s. What was that like? Oh, that's... 
probably the favorite, my favorite film that I've been involved in. Um, and nobody saw it. I remember speaking to um, a, a high-ranking guy at Polygram Film back in the 90s, and he said to me, if Jude would have come out after Elizabeth, which I was in, and after Titanic, which Kate Winslet was in, and Kate was the female lead in Jude, you'd have probably gone to the Oscars. It's business, you know? It was a business thing. Our visibility, mine and Kate's visibility, for a film that was so dark wasn't strong enough. Because it is a dark film. But um, directed by one of the greatest British film directors, Michael Winterbottom. And it was a particular favorite of mine because Jude is um, a blue collar stonemason who dreams of going to Oxford and Cambridge and learning classical Greek and Latin. Um, it was an argument for inclusion with education. It was an argument that everybody deserves a good education. And that money should not buy you education. And that's very, you know, that's very important in my country because Boris Johnson, the only reason he became prime minister is because he had money for an education and look what he did with it. He lied, you know, so. Moving swiftly on from the politics. <laughs> so thank you for mentioning Jude. I, yeah. Looks like we have an 11th doctor to asking you a question over here. Go ahead. Hello, Matt. Hello. My name is Justin, and this is about my fourth awesome con, and it is a pleasure to meet you. You were my first doctor, actually. And um, you as the ninth doctor, you had such a groundedness in the role, but you also had a charming quirkiness. And I just wanted to know how much of that was your doing or the director. You also had the iconic, fantastic catchphrase. Well, you never listen to directors. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, what was the process like coming up with that character? And can you say fantastic as the ninth doctor for us? If you're good, Matt, if you're good, I might. Um, I based it on Russell T. Davis, really, the craziness of... If you ever see Russell at a panel, um, I based it on Russell. Um, half Russell, half me. And it was fantastic. Thank you very much. We have about a minute left, and we have another doctor here to ask questions. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan. I've been coming to Austin Con for about like eight years. I was originally going to come during 2020 when you were playing Aaron showing up, but obviously that didn't work out. Yeah. COVID. Um, but my question is, you've been doing your own stuff with Big Finish, and Billy Piper has as well. Um, is there any chance that you two will do another thing together for them? I think you should ask Big Finish that, shouldn't you? Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> and my agent's drunk in the corner if you want to. <laughs> okay, I think this might be our last question, so go ahead. Hello, my name is Eric, and this is my fifth year at Awesome Con. And I would like to ask you if you could write up a script for Doctor Who at this point, what would the storyline be, and which folks would you choose to act in this one with you? So that's what I would like to ask you. I'd return as the doctor, Donald Trump, and Boris Johnson would play themselves. I would have a huge liar gun razor, and I'd take them into a darkened room and speak to them. <laughs> Wonderful last question. Um, what, what do we have, uh, as, we as we conclude, uh, anything to look forward to? Like, what's next for you? So, I've just fulfilled an ambition of a lifetime and acted opposite um, Jodie Foster. And they say, don't meet your heroes. I say, meet your heroes. So, I'm in 
the new series of True Detective with Jodie Foster. I did a film called um, The Young Woman and the Sea, playing a German, Jewish, Scottish swimming instructor opposite Daisy Ridley. And I think on Monday or Tuesday of this week, there's going to be an announcement in London about a theatre job that I'm going to do, but I can't say anything yet. And then are you with us at the con for the rest of the weekend? Yep. I'm just here today. Just here today. All right. Hey, let's give it up for David or Christopher Atkinson. Thank you. He nearly said David Tennant. <laughs> Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. Open, oh, have fun, and follow your fandom.